looks like Christian and Dakota and Jack and Kaylee and TJ and Tyler. Hi guys, it's uh, nice to see you all on a Monday morning. I'll just quickly go through our agenda and what we're gonna be doing today. Um, real quickly, I did send out your RSVP reminder um, for our holiday party, so just make sure um, if you're able to go that you put your name on there and the total number of people. Okay, we will go over our interim test, numbers 11 through 21, because last week we did um, numbers one through 10, so we'll make sure we do that. And then we'll switch gears a little bit and we will review what we started last week with, um, with summarizing. And then at the end of class, oh yay, I see a bunch of, yay, this is awesome. A bunch of people put their summaries on here so we can peer edit, that's awesome. Um, hopefully we'll have some time for some of the discussion questions about the story that you read um, on the different volcanoes. And then I'll go over your new strategy, which is questioning um, and what you'll be doing for next week. But not to take any more time, let's just get right into that interim test and start looking at number 11 and so forth. So let's see. A second to scroll down here. And actually, I think we, um, we had number 12. That's where we left off. And I actually know what number 12 is about. Has anybody heard of personification before? Jack, do you know what personification is? Look like you were saying yes. No? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I'm getting there. It's taking a minute. Ah. Okay. Personification is when you give an object that... It, oh, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah. Isn't personification when you give an ob an, an unhuman object human-like qualities? That's exactly right. It's when you give something that is not alive, like a rock or a desk or something, um, a human quality. Something that, I should say, something that is not a human, you give it a human quality. So obviously a flower is not a human, um, a rock is not a human, but you give it a human-like quality. So... Read the following sentence. The flower begged for water. Okay, begged is a human quality. Flowers do not actually beg for anything. So that is an example of personification. Very good. I see you guys typing into the chat the correct answers. That's great. So number 13, um, which of the following shows a cause and effect relationship? So cause and effect is you have an event which has, which makes other things happen. So let's see, cause and effect. I like chocolate ice cream, but my friend likes strawberry. Mm. The fact that I like chocolate does not mean that it's gonna make my friend like strawberry, no. Okay, good, I see a lot of people already, um, already typing into the answer. It snowed, so I had to shovel the sidewalk. The cause was it snowed, the effect is I had to go out and shovel. Okay. All right, number 14. This is pretty easy. Um, the phrase dime a dozen. Dime a dozen means it's cheap, basically. You can um, you could get a bunch of them, like 12 of them, for a dime. It's, it's cheap. So the best answer would be... D, scissors are cheap and easy to get. They come a dime a dozen. Okay, very good. Back up to 15. Okay, so now we're switching gears into nonfiction. Identify which text feature would best assist your understanding of a picture, picture in a nonfiction text. So that's right, all of you have got this correct. I see a bunch of Ds popping up. A picture always has a, or not always, but should have a caption to explain it. Okay. All right, moving on. Number, um, looks like 16 through 18, was all about this um, article on the Statue of Liberty. So number 16, over on the right-hand column there, in the passage, the author states, 
a group of Frenchmen were talking about their dictator and the democratic government of the United States. So a dictator is completely opposite of the type of government we have here in the United States, which is a democracy. But if you did not know what a dictator was, and you wanted to know what kind of um, leader they have in France, where can I go and find the definition of dictator? Getting some answers into the chat. And that's right, everybody is putting A. If you don't know, you can go and look it up in a dictionary. Am I going too fast for anyone? I'm going pretty fast, but we have a lot to get to, so. All right, number 17, choose the statement that does not show the cause of France giving the United States the Statue of Liberty. So basically, you have to look at all of these different answers and which one is not a reason that France gave us the Statue of Liberty. Good, Dakota. Good, Kaylee. Good, Kaylee. Perfect. The reason, this is not a reason they gave us the Statue of Liberty. It doesn't even really make sense. The other three, A, B, and C, are reasons. Okay, moving on. Oop. Okay, it's not letting me scroll. Hold on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. The last paragraph um, of the passage has lots of facts about the Statue of Liberty. Find one fact about the Statue of Liberty in the passage and explain how you know it is a fact and not an opinion. Well, this was pretty easy because they only wanted you to find one. So go back to that last paragraph, fun facts, and tell me what uh, fact you pulled out. Anybody? Jack. Visitors climbed 354 steps, 22 stories, to look out from 25 windows in the crown. That's exactly right. This is a fact. We know that it has 340, I'm sorry, 54 steps and is 22 stories high. How do you know that's a fact, Jack? Because it doesn't say I think or it's, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And it can be proven. You can actually measure um, the height and you can measure how many, or count, I guess, how many steps there were. So here was another fact, how tall it is. Um, I guess if you wanted to back up just a little bit, here was another fact that Dakota pointed out that in 1886, it was dedicated to us. All of those things can be proven. So in your response, they gave you quite a bit of space again. That's one thing you needed to make sure that you included, that you know how it was a fact. Something to the effect of it can be measured, um, it can be looked up in history books, the date, that kind of thing. All right. 19 through 21, this was, um, this was interesting. What, what is this thing here that we're looking at? Attention young writers. What is that? Tyler. It, like, do you mean like just the saying attention young writers or the whole? Yeah, well, like if I didn't know what this was, what is it? Isn't it an article? Yeah, it's an article, but it's um, it's actually like a contest description. It's a description of um, what you need to do to win an essay. So basically, it tells you who can participate, what it is. It's a creative writing contest. That's what it is. And it tells you what you need to do in order to participate tells you where to participate or basically where to send your stuff. Tells you when your article would need to be submitted. Um, and it tells you a little bit about the prizes and the judges who will judge the contest. So number 19, based on the information in the flyer, so I guess it's a flyer, um, you can infer that the judges will probably mm -hmm. select the first, second, and third place winners. And we can go down here. 
When do you think they will select the winners? You could type it into the chat. <clears throat> okay, getting a couple answers. Here's another important section to look at when you're making your decision. Okay, so here's, um, this is actually maybe a little trickier than you would think. Inferring, remember, means making your best um, guess, in other words. So January 12th is when they're going to print it in the newspaper. So that would be too late to actually choose because they, they're printing it on that day into the newspaper, so they've already had to choose it. Uh, January 22nd is way too late because it's already been printed. In the afternoon of November 22nd, mm, I doubt it because guess what? They have until 5.30 p.m. on November 22nd to turn in their paper. So if I start judging things on you know November 22nd at 1 p.m., I might miss out on some entries. So the only logical answer is B. So that one was kind of tricky. You had to look, you had to look here, and then you also had to look at when they were going to print it in the newspaper. So, okay, number twenty. Which of the following is an acceptable entry into the writing contest? So. You may enter an original short story, an essay, poem, or play up to a thousand words. So a thousand words or less. So which one of these would be an acceptable um, entry? That's right, Dakota. That's right. Okay, everybody got it. It's C, a 700-word essay about the life of a brave scientist. Perfect. And number 21 was your last writing, um, and you had to, let's see, in the space below, evaluate the author of this flyer and how they use text features to contribute to the overall meaning. Basically, text features were that they were very organized by making different categories. So it was just, um, that's probably all you could really say about it, is that they organized their information um, in a logical way. So, any questions about um, numbers 11 through 21? Okay, then we'll move on. All right, we'll switch gears a little bit and we'll start thinking about that um, volcano book that I sent you last week. Did everybody have a chance to read that? Cool. Did everybody have a chance to write a summary? Yay! I, I can see some of you did because they're actually on this. So that's fantastic. Um, our objective basically was to summarize and understand the text and to identify the main ideas and supporting details. So I'll share my summary with you in just a second. But let's go to the book so that I could just refresh your memory. Okay, pull it up here. Of course they wouldn't keep me logged in. That would be that would be crazy. All right. So I'm just gonna do a little think aloud on how I wrote my summary. Okay. Scrolling down, sorry, taking a second. Okay, so remember, we had these different sections of the book. Um, we had the first section, which I'm going to share my summary here in just five seconds. And then we had these other sections, and then this was the one that you wrote your summary on. So just to kind of recap, as I 
Well, here's another thing too, that might've been helpful for some of you. And I'm just going to, I'm going to keep saying underline or highlight. Sometimes it's kind of nice when you can print out the book and then actually highlight or with a highlighter or underline, like with a pen or pencil, some of these important details as you go along. So as I read this first section, I noticed most of the sentence in, sentences mentioned something about the eruption at Mount Vesuvius. Um, I would underline or highlight where it happened and the date, because those are important. I also read that the dust, and I'm, remember I'm kind of going paragraph by paragraph and pulling out only the important stuff. Um, I read that dust, ash, and lava poured from the volcano and it destroyed everything in its path. Okay, so there's something I would highlight. I read that buildings collapsed and people died as they tried to flee. Okay, here we go. So there's one little thing that I would highlight. And now I'm on to my next paragraph. Okay. Then I also read that 11 hours later, surge clouds fell down the mountain at a speed of 310 miles per hour. And within moments, all the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum were burned. So right here is where I'm looking. Okay. So basically, I, um, I just showed you how I would have, if I would have printed this out and had a hard copy, how I would have underlined or highlighted the important details. Now I actually have to write the summary. So I'll go back and show you what I did. Okay. Um, so to summarize, basically we took the most important information and here it is. In 79, or sorry, AD 79, the people of Pompeii thought beautiful Mount Vesuvius was dormant. But that year, its eruption caused catastrophic results. Lava, hot ash, stones, and poisonous gas that destroyed all life. The powerful surge clouds that followed 11 hours after the eruption completely burned the two cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum. They were not uncovered again for more than 1,000 years. Okay. So that's my summary. Remember our strategies. First thing is to give compliments. Any compliments on my summary? Kaylee, yes. I like how you used um, the setting. Oh, good. Well, yeah, that's an important detail. I definitely needed to talk about where it happened, of course. Anything else that was good? Jack? I don't think your microphone's on, Jack. You 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 have really good detail? Oh, good. Yes, yeah, so I gave a lot of details. Um, one thing that I purposely did is I used a really cool word, um, catastrophic. I could have said bad results, but uh, catastrophic is a much better word. Um, and it looks like in the chat, Kaylee P says it's really good. I liked how you used non-boring words. So that's kind of what I just said. One of my suggestions, and I'm just going to tell you um, a suggestion for myself, is I did not have a conclusion sentence. I had a topic sentence, but I didn't have a conclusion sentence. Remember, conclusion sentences give no new information. Oops. And what I have here, that gives a little bit of new information. So I need to just wrap it up with a conclusion sentence. So I can just say, the eruption still fascinates people today. Okay. So that's just a, a more general um, conclusion statement. Are there any other suggestions that you guys can give me on how to make it better? 
it was pretty good. <laughs> um, I, I, whatever, I, I didn't make it bad. I made it pretty good. So, um, there really aren't any corrections. I did not misspell anything. And I remember to indent, um, I used, um, commas and everything correctly. So I think we're probably ready to move on to your summaries. And we have um, Tyler inputted his. We have Jax. And we have Kaylee S. So we can peer edit um, at least one of them so that we, um, you know, can do it together. And then later on, you guys can come in here because, you know, you have you have access to this um, agenda. Hopefully it's even up on your own screen right now. And you have editing rights, so you can type directly onto this. Um, but between Tyler, Jack, and Kaylee S., do I have any volunteers to let the class peer edit? Okay, I see Jack. Let's go to Jack's summary. Okay, Jack, I'm going to let you read it to us. A volcano is a landform, usually a mountain where molten rock erupts through the surface of a planet. A volcano opens downward to a pool of molten rock below the surface of Earth. The cylinders that come out of the black and now hardened pieces of cylinder cones. Brand new volcanoes appear as cylinder cones. Cylinder cones sometimes pile up inside craters that are larger and older volcanoes. Lava domes form these structures, thick and pasty liquid that comes from the vent and quickly hardens. More lava pushes up and expands throughout the center of the dome. The lava dome often, fa often found in places where, with lots of volcanic activity. Lava domes are, and cylinder domes are big and powerful, big, powerful, and wonderful pieces of nature. Okay, so let's start with compliments, and I'll start it off um, right away, maybe because it's the last thing that you just said. Um, you have a great conclusion sentence. It does not give any new information, and it wraps up your paragraph very nicely. Any other compliments for Jack? Tyler. He ha he does... He kind of has a topic sentence it's like it talks about volcanoes in general so it's yeah about all of them so i think that's kind of good actually it is pretty good because he's talking about what a volcano is and then he gets into the two different types cinder cones or lava domes um yeah, I mean, we might be able to make it just a little more general, but for the most part, he does have a topic sentence, and it's good. Um, he also used a lot of great details. He described what a cinder cone is, how it forms, and he also described what a lava dome is and how they form. So he gave all of the important stuff that we needed. Um, any other compliments before we, you know, maybe make a suggestion or two? No? Okay. Any suggestions for Jack on how we can make this um, maybe more clear or maybe anything sound better? Looks like a couple people might be typing, so I'll just give them a second. Let's look at that topic sentence again and see what we can, you know, maybe do. A volcano is a landform, usually a mountain. And this part right here, I think there needs to be um there needs to be a comma or something because it's kind of it's kind of a run-on sentence. A volcano is a landform, usually a mountain where molten rock erupts through the surface of the planet. So, how about I put the commas that I need? A volcano is a landform comma, usually a mountain. How about mountain shape? Comma, where molten rock erupts through the surface of the planet. Okay. 
So that made it a little bit more clear. A volcano opens downward to a pool of molten rock below the surface of the earth. Um, I think that's pretty good. I'll, I'll leave it. The cinders that come from the black and now harden... Okay, I'm seeing something that maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense. How can I reword this sentence to make it sound a little more clear? Anybody? Okay, go ahead, Tyler. I think first that it should say what a cinder is. Okay. Like. So maybe we should move this sentence right here? I well, think that there should be a small sentence before explaining what a cinder is. Okay. is and what is a cinder cone i was talking the, the, the about the cinders that come out of the rock and make the make it into a cinder cone oh yes it's small pieces of rock so it's small pieces of rock that are spewed so we could go back to our text actually and find like a really good sentence that we can, um, that'll help us say exactly what a cinder is. Okay, so I'm gonna get to that section. Here we go. Reread the first paragraph, everyone. I think we should use this sentence, or at least this idea. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to, okay. In a cinder cone, small lava chunks and bits of ash harden into light rocks called cinders. Then the cinders that come from the black and now harden, ooh, see, this part doesn't make sense. So you know what? We talked about what a cinder is. Let's just take it out. Such hills are called cinder cones. Yep, we already know that. Okay. Brand new volcanoes appear as cinder cones. What do you guys think? Is that, um, super important information that we should leave or or could we take that out <coughs> this is an opinion i mean some people might think differently i think it could probably be taken out cinder cones sometimes pile up inside craters of larger or older volcanoes Okay, great. Now let's move on to talking about lava domes. Lava domes form, not forms, form from these structures. A thick and pasty liquid that comes from the vent and quickly hardens. Is that a complete sentence? Yeah, that one's not a complete sentence, so how can I fix it? What should I say? My voice is getting, um, or my throat is getting dry, guys. You guys got to come up with something. How about from a lava dome? Thick and pasty liquid 
comes from the vent and quickly hardens. Now it's a complete sentence. More lava pushes up and expands through the center of the dome. That's fine. The lava domes are often found in places with a lot of volcanic activity. I'm going to add a detail and have violent explosions. And I'm going to go back to cinder cones and talk about how they actually spew only a little bit of uh, lava because it shows a difference between lava domes and cinders or cinder cones. And spray only a mm -hmm. little lava. Okay. And then we already said that his um, conclusion sentence was fantastic. All right. Tyler, go ahead. In the middle of the paragraph, right after the bold cinders, is a whole bunch of random spaces. Oh, um, let's see. Are you talking about this paragraph? It, right after where it says cinders and bold, your mouse is on it right now. There's a whole bunch of spaces. Just something. Yeah, you're right. It should only have two. That's exactly right. Okay. So that was definitely a correction. Um, no corrections as far as indenting or misspellings. And we already fixed um, the commas that he needed to add. All right, guys. So that was pretty fun. If you have time, I would love for you to peer edit um, each other's, like Tyler's and Kaylee S's. Okay. Moving on. Oops. We got a couple discussion questions. We'll talk about those. All right, here we go. Ugh. Number one. What is the cause and effect relationship that might happen as a result of Mount Fuji becoming active? So I'm going to help you out a little bit. Here's the cause. Mount Oops. Mount Fuji becomes active. What would, just make an inference, what would the effect be? What might happen? Kaylee S. It erupts. Okay. Um, yeah, it becomes active. That's part of the cause. And erupts. The effect, what effect might that have, though, on the surrounding maybe villages? Tyler. The surrounding villages could be destroyed and burned, and there might, it might be just as bad as Mount Vesuvius. Yeah, oops, I spelled that. Okay, why am I, I'm not having a, a good time today spelling. Destroy, thank you, and burnt. It might be as bad as Mount Vesuvius. Good. Number two, and Kaylee also said people might die. Yes, I'll add that. Good. Number two. How could you sort the volcanoes into the world of the world into different categories? So what are different things that you can sort a volcano by? I'll give you one type. What else can you sort volcanoes by? Jack? Where? Location. Good. Ooh, time of eruption. Yes. I'm getting a couple more into the chat. Size. Shape, even. Perfect. Those are good examples. Number three. 
Why do you think people take the risk of living close to a volcano? Okay, I got one answer. There's two answers. Okay. Okay, I'm just typing what I'm getting into the chat. Okay, so basically what I got is <clears throat> there's rich soil and it has a, it offers a nice view. So yeah, those are good reasons. When you read the book, you should have noticed some differences between composite and shield volcanoes. So how are composite volcanoes different than shield volcanoes. Anybody remember? I can go back to the text. Hold on just one second. Okay. Remember, this is what you would do if you didn't remember. Okay, so let's go to the section that starts composite volcanoes. I want you to start skimming through the section on composite volcanoes. Let's give everybody a second to just kind of refresh their memory, Jack. Okay, I'll scroll down. Okay, now we're gonna talk about shield volcanoes. Do you guys notice any differences? I know that was pretty quick. Jack? Shield volcanoes run, run, run very fast, run faster than the um, composite volcanoes. Okay, so lava runs faster? Yeah, like, yeah. They are also, I got from Ashley, they erupt gently. and are shaped like a shield. Oops. Um, composite volcanoes are explosive and intense, good. And shaped more like a mountain. We could probably find even more details, but those are some real important differences. Okay. Number five, lava is melted liquid rock. Is this a fact or an opinion? Great, Dakota? It's a fact. And how can you tell it's a fact? What do you think? Because it can be proven, maybe? <laughs> That's probably your easiest answer. Okay. Number six, how do you think scientists have gained so much information about volcanoes? How have they gained info?
Okay, I got one answer. They study them. They visit them. They observe them and they test them. Very good. Okay, and that was not a complete sentence. That's my bad. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to show you um, what you're going to be working on next. We just finished summarizing. And we did a really good job of pulling out main ideas and supporting details and then writing a summary. We're going to switch gears and go to the questioning strategy. So let me show you what you're going to get in your email very soon. You're going to get a new book on Abraham Lincoln, okay? It's really cool, and I chose that because that video is out right now. <clears throat> Not video, that movie about Abraham Lincoln is out right now. Okay, so you're going to get a new book, Abraham Lincoln. You're going to get something that looks like... No, that's not the right one. Ah! It looks like this. It's a KWL chart. So before you read the book, you're going to fill out the first box about what you already know about Abraham Lincoln. You're going to fill out the second box with questions that you want to know about Abraham Lincoln. Then you're going to read the book. We will do this part together next week, what you learned. We'll, we'll um, fill out this last part together. So all you have to do is write what you already know and some questions that you want to answer. Any questions on what you'll do for next week? No? All right, guys. Well, it has been a blast. We're done a little early, and that's totally fine. You guys were, like, right on top of things today, so we went fast. But um, let's all wave goodbye. Bye. Have a good day. <laughs> Thanks.